Welcome to Collaborative Statistics, Statistics Chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2 is on descriptive statistics. Now, what exactly are descriptive statistics? They are um, ways to describe the data, basically. And we have two things we can do with this. We can either display them graphically in forms of, and here we're going to talk about stem plots and histograms and box plots, um, or we can calculate it mathematically, which will give us information about the location uh, of the data, the center of the data, and the spread, or you know how wide the data is uh, dispersed. So there's some things we're going to need, key symbols we're going to need to look at. Um, here's a bunch of them. Sigma here, this is capital sigma, this means summing. Okay, it just means that we're going to sum stuff, and in this case we're going to sum the data little n. This is the uh, number of values that are in a sample, whereas capital N is the size of a population. X bar, the reason it's written like this is you'll see it also like this most times. X bar, um, it's the sample mean. You know, we're going to add them up, add up the values, divide by n. S, lowercase s, is the sample standard deviation. This weird looking u is the Greek letter mu. This is stands for the population mean. This weird six is really a sigma. Okay, it's the Greek letter sigma or Greek letter S, and this is the population standard deviation. So we have lowercase regular S the sample standard deviation. Sigma is the population standard deviation. This is lowercase, uppercase sigma it means sum. So we have the three S's that we have to work with. F stands for frequency, and X stands for just one value in the data. So we have a couple of formulas for standard deviation. Uh, they're kind of the same, but they change depending on whether we're looking at a sample or the population. Uh, and when we're doing the sample, we add up all of our values. We're finding the deviation from the mean, so we take our each X, and we subtract it from we subtract the mean from it, then we square it. Then we're dividing by the dividing by n minus one. So we're taking how many things there were using one less. Whereas if we were doing the population standard deviation, notice we're dividing by n. Okay, so that's the big difference between these two. Then after we're done, we take the square root. Okay, the reason we square this is because we want to get rid of negatives. We're going to have both positive and negatives. If we add them together, we get zero. So to fix that we have to actually square them and because we squared it we have to unsquare it to get back to an actual number. This formula here deals with if we have frequencies um, you're not going to you're going to see this a lot less often this is the most more common value uh, formula we use so we're going to stick with that. Okay and this is the formula for mean. Um, here we have x bar okay which is just adding up our x's dividing by n and mu which is adding up our x's and dividing by n so notice in this case the formulas don't change except for whether we have a little n or a big n this is the population uh this is the population size this is the sample size so uh, we don't very seldom know this number i mean this only occurs if we were looking at say um major league baseball there's only 750 players, you know, in Major League Baseball, so we can easily take those values and we can find the, you know, the batting average of the 750 players and how many at bats there were total, um, to, and to get a number. Whereas, you know, we may take a few baseball players and take a sample and find their stand, their average, you know, batting average, you know, for a few players. So. But very seldom do we ever actually calculate this. We're usually given this value um, as an as an as an as a, as a thing. Um, and notice here we, again we have frequency tables. In case you have a frequency table, you take the frequency of the value, the frequency of the value times the the value, add that add all those up, and again divide by n, and that will give us our average. So as I said, there's ways to do describe them and the first way is graphically so we have a couple where we have stem and leaf plot or stem plot and you'll see it written both ways and what this does is it kind of makes 
a bar chart of the values, starting with our stems. Notice these are our tens values. And then, so this value is 33. And then this is 42, and 49, and 49, and 53, and 55, and 55, and 61, and 60. And so it allows us to see all of the data values as well as kind of seeing it graphically. You know, this kind of looks like a bar chart. Um, and so that's one way. And this here is helpful because it kind of gives us the next idea, which is called a histogram. Now, a histogram, um, we take our values and we notice we have now a bar chart going up to seeing how high those values go and the information about how to do it. So we want to be, um, when we're picking the values to choose for our table, we're going to have things that are one decimal place more precise. So if we're looking all at ones, then we're going to have cut our, our values in ha you know in halves, okay? And then we have to figure out our starting point and our ending point, and then divide by how many things we want. And that's going to be how wide we want them to be. Or if we we can figure, decide how many bars we want, where I want five bars, so we have to divide by five, and that's how wide my my bins are going to be. Or I can decide that I want my bins to be you know one, and so I then need to use that division to figure out how many bars I get. And then we go back and forth. And that's how you do it by hand. We very seldom ever will do anything by hand because we don't have to. Uh, this is directions on how to use the TI-83. Um, I'm actually going to make a video showing you how to do this, or we can I'll grab one from the internet, from YouTube. Um, but this is how you do it. And here's all the steps. You make sure you clear out your data that's in your statistics. Then you actually put all the data in. Uh, you may have to put in, um, in this case we're going to have two rows. We have numbers and we have frequencies. Then we you know, put out, you know, draw out, here's all the pieces we want. This is the values that we want, This the minimum, the maximums, how big we want them to be. Um, then we go into the Y thing and we're going to do the stat plot, which is here. Uh, and then make sure that it's on. We're going to go and choose that histogram and we're going to go through and we're going to graph it. We can skip this step here by, and we're going to see in the next thing using zoom stat, which will pick all the values all it wants and then we can, you know, it will do it for us. So, um, there's a couple of ways to do these things and there, we'll show you, up, I'll show you, I'll try to show you the, all of them. So. Here's the other graphical way to do it, which is a box plot. Now, on a box plot, it shows five numbers. It's a five-number summary. We take the minimum value, which is here, the maximum value. We take the median, which is the value that's halfway between the numbers. It's you know 50% of the data is below it, and 50% of the data is above it. And then the two quartiles, the first quartile and the third quartile, and we draw lines on all those and then we make a rectangle and we have our box plot. Okay, This gives us a lot of information graphically. We can see that this is where the middle 50% of the data is. This is where our mean is. We can see here's our minimum, here's our maximum. We can look and kind of see skewing going on. Uh, we have we're also able to figure out if there's outliers and outliers here it says are uh, 1.5 times the IQR. The IQR is the interquartile range, you know, Q3 minus Q1. And one, so it's either going to be 1.5 times below the first quartile or 1.5 times above the third quartile. Those are possible outliers that will come up. And again, here is how we go through and, and do it on a calculator after we put our data in. Um, we, instead of choosing uh, the histogram, we choose the box plot, which is the fifth one. And we do, and remember I talked about zoom stat, well there's zoom and nine, and that will set up our range so we can actually see all the data. And again, we can trace it to find all the values along the, the box plot. So that's graphically. Now we're going to start talking about location. Location, remember we just mentioned the quartiles in the box plots, well the quartiles, there's really three of them. 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, and the 75th percentile because they're in quarters. Uh, this means that 25% of the data is below that value. 50% of the data is below the second quartile. 75% of the data is below the third quartile. 
And we don't have to just have quartiles, we can have, have percentiles, or break it down into hundredths. So this allows us to have smaller versions, like the 80th percentile, and the 20th percentile, and the 36th percentile. Now, to find these things, we have to put them in order from smallest to largest. Okay, um, And then, therefore, the that's, that's our first step. Then we count them. Okay, We can see how many values are, if we're looking for a value, um, excuse me, here, that the 80th percentile, so I have a the spelling error, uh, we have to find the value that where 80% of the data is less than that. So if I have 50 values that I'm looking at, I need to find the 40th value, because that was where 80% of the values are going to be below that value, okay, because 80 times, 0.8 times 50 is 40. So the, f the 40th value, so that's where that lies. The other way is like, okay, I'm going to be giving a number and saying, okay, well, what is you know percentile below this value? And so I look to find where that value is. And if I say, okay, well, gee, I'm looking for, the answer comes out to be the 26th number out of 50. Then I divide 26 by 50, and I get 52%. Uh, so 52% of the data is below, that's the 52nd percentile. So that's what happens. It just depends, but you always want to put the values in order for quartiles and for centiles, and then do the math. Um, the other thing, next thing we're going to look at is measure of center, the central tendency, where it is. And there's a couple, there's three measures of central tendency. We're going to go over them at first. The mean, okay. Um, we know it as the average, we've been taught it as the average. You know, you add up all the items, divide by how many there are. It's this big fancy formula that <laughs> says is add up all the x's, divide by n. Okay, here's another way to write it: one over n times the sum of all the x's from one to n. You know, i where i is one to n, and this is what it means: just add them all up and divide by how many there are. So we've always called it the average, and now we're being told to call it the mean. The reason is because when we talk about the average something, sometimes we mean mean, and sometimes we mean mo uh, median, and sometimes we mean mode. So average kind of no longer well, it's the mathematical term for it in. Uh, colloquialism, it could be a different thing, so we try to avoid that term um, in discussion and statistics. So the second one I mentioned was median. All right, now the median, um, if you think of a highway, I always mention this: the, the green stuff in the middle. Okay, that's the median strip. Right? It means the middle <laughs> of the highway. So uh, that's all it is. It's the middle value. All right, if we put them all in order, okay, and then we find the, the middle value where half are below and half are above. Now, there's two things we have to do. If the, we have an odd number of values, say we have 25 values, we take the 13th one because 12 are below and 12 are above. It's the same amount. All right, it's like a balance. All right, but if we have an even number, we don't have, we're going to take the, you know, if I have 26 values, I would take the 13 and a half value. Well, I don't have a 13 and a half value, so uh, that would give me 27 values. And so I, what I need to do is I need to take the average of the 13th and 14th values and go, okay, that's where the center is. And so the median doesn't have to be a value that's on the list in this case, right? You know, I can, if I have two, if they're the same number, obviously it'll be the same. But if there are two different values, I'll come up with a, a value that's not on my list. All right, and so don't worry about the fact that if you come up with a median value that's not on your list. And you know, to calculate it, we get uh, we put our data in on the calculator. We go to uh, statistics, and we arrow over. We're going to go to calc, and then we take the one variable statistics and hit enter, and tell it where this is. And if we have um, uh, frequencies, it'll ask, it says L1, it says frequency 1. If we have a frequency table, we would have L1 and then put the frequencies in L2, we would bring that up. And then as we scroll down, we'll see the mean, median, mode, we'll see other things like mean and median, we'll see standard deviation. We won't see mode, because uh, it doesn't do that, um, because a mode can have more than one answer and calculators don't like things that can give you more than one answer. Um, so uh, we We'll get different things. You know, we'll have all kinds of data. We'll have the sums. We'll have the uh, how many values there were in the data, and it will give us all this in the one variable statistics. Mode is the thing that happens the most often. Okay, so if I have a list of numbers, 
the one that's the highest is the moat. <laughs> and that's the thing you need to look at. All right, that's just how many, and you can have more, things that happen more, we can have more than one answer. If I have um, a, a group, I can have something that's bimodal or trimodal, I can have no answer. They all exer occur the exact same number of times. So there's no mode, or it's everything is a mode. So, you know, it, that, that's why this doesn't really show up as a calculator thing. Um, but sometimes it is a useful tool. It is the center because, you know, it's say you have all 100s on your homework and then you decide not to pass one in. Well, you have, you know, 1500s and a zero. I mean, when we do the math, the calculate the average at zero brings it down. Um, the median in mode would be in that case would be the same value, but, um, you know, we have a lot of hundreds, so I would assume that you're really your average work is a hundred. It's just that you didn't do one; you were sick that day or something, and so that's how mode affects what we look at. Skews. Skew talks about when we make a histogram, we're going to see a graph, and it's going to lean to one side or the other. And we can have three things: we can have symmetric which means that the mean, the median, the mode are all the same value. and We get this kind of hill. Okay, it's a perfect hill. And eventually we're going to talk about the normal curve and you'll see that it's a normal curve. We can have left skewed, which is shows us that the mean is less than the median, which is less than the mode. Notice our highest value is here, but when we do our math, our median our mean comes out over here and our median comes up over here. So this, because we have lower numbers, it's dragged it down. We have this tail over here on the left. We can also have right skewed, which means that it comes out that the mean is greater than the median and greater than the mode. Because we have this tail that's drawn our values higher, the mean becomes larger. The mode is way down here, and here's the median. So, um, skewed to the left, means the mean is going to be less than the median is going to be less than the mode. Skewed to the right, the mean is greater than the median and greater than the mean, which is greater than the mode. Because outliers affect the mean more than anything else. Okay, it's, that's the one that's most affected by the mean and about outliers. And that's why we don't always talk about mean as the average. When we're talking at average income, we have people who are making zero, but we have people who are making hundreds and millions of dollars a year those values would bring up the averages. So we don't look at that. We look at the median income. Well, where is the 50% mark? Where is, where is the value that's 50% is below and 50% is above? And we'll notice that that number is much smaller than the mean income, so, and possibly the mode income. So that's central tendency and um, how it looks. Spread. Spread, we use standard deviation. So this gives us a number to talk about how wide things are. In other words, remember we talked about the interquartile range and we had the minimum and maximum in the first, and, uh, second, and third quartiles. Well, that gives us an idea of how numbers are spread out, but I don't have a value to give to it. The standard deviation gives you a value. Okay? And what we do is we calculate how each value differs from the average and use that and we standardize it. That's what squaring it and taking the square root of it does. We square, dividing and square and square rooting. We take we're standardizing it. Um, this allows us to compare one value from one set to a value in another set. So I can look from year to year. Are the spreads different? Okay, because the means may be the same, but the spreads are different. Um, and that helps me give a value. It also, I might have different means, you know, but and the spreads are different. So I can see, well, this one person better than the other person based on the years or the schools or whatever I'm looking at. So again, here's the formulas. Um, square root of the sum of the differences of the means. If I you take x minus x bar, square it, add them all up, divide by n minus 1 because we're most likely looking at a sample. They will tell you if you're using a population, and then you make sure you use this formula. But in most cases, we're dealing with S. So this is the one you really need to know. This is how it works. <laughs> okay, this one has been given from a frequency table, which I said you know we never knew, but here we have one. Um, so we subtract our Xs from our mean. So we 
did all this work, we found the mean, and we multiplied 9 times 1 and 9 by 5 times 2 and 10 times 10, and added them up and divided by how many there were, and we came up with this value, and we subtracted the mean from each one. So we have all these. If I add these together, I'm going to get 0. So, well, actually, I, w but I would because I would be multiplying these things together. Okay, then I'm going to square them. So I square them all up. Now I have all positive values, so I can add them. But first I have to take multiply them by their frequencies. So I had one of those, and two of those, and four of those, and so on. And so now I add these together, and I get a value, which I'm then going to divide by n minus 1. And I believe there's, uh, let's see, 10, 14, 17, there's 20 things, so I'm going to divide by 19, and then take the screw root. And that's going to give me my standard deviation. Before I take the screw root, I have what's called the variance, okay, which is another number that's going to come into play every once in a while. So sometimes they'll tell you the variance is, and all that means is to find the standard deviation, you just take the square root of it. So and it's going to be a much larger number because it's all squared. So these are the steps, and this is why we don't do it by hand. There's lots of work there. What we do is we use the calculator. <laughs> you know, we put in our sta our statistics, we put in our data. And you know here they're uh, they're actually making our frequencies, and then when we go to our one variable statistics, remember I said you know it had mean and median, it also has standard deviation. So as we go through, we're going to see that we're going to see those numbers. We're going to see both the population and the sample standard deviations. So here's some rules that this guy Chebyshev uh, came up with, and he said that no matter what. 75% of all the data is within two standard deviations of the mean. So once I've come up with a standard with the standard deviation of the mean, if I multiply it by two, at least 75% of the data is in that space. Okay, at least 89% of the data is within within when I say it means plus or minus three standard deviations. So I take the mean, I add, I take the standard deviation, multiply it by three, I add it to the mean, and I subtract it from the mean. And 89% of the data is within that, and 95% of the data is within four and a half standard deviations. Well, this is good stuff to know, but it's this is for everything. What we're look really interested in is the next one here, the uh, empirical rule or 68.95.99.7 rule, because this talks about symmetric data. And eventually, we're going to assume that all populations, uh, unless told otherwise, are symmetric. And um, the reason we're going to do that is because we're going to come up with, we're going to learn something uh, called the central limit theorem, which tells us that if we keep taking averages of stuff, they become symmetric. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what the uh, data looked like originally, we can turn it into a, uh, a normal mound shaped curve and use this rule. So in this rule it says that 68% of the data is within one standard deviation, 95% of the data is within two, and 99.7 is within three. And the one that's going to be the most important here is this two standard deviations. Okay, we're going to see this a lot in like chapters seven through ten. So um, this is pretty important stuff. All right, this is the one that's going to come back, and you're going to see that everywhere um, from pretty much from chapter seven on. So or eight, I can't remember. I think it's it's uh, when we get to um, confidence intervals, maybe chapter eight. Um, but so that's a very important one to come up with, to remember. And that's all for chapter two. Um, I'll see you in chapter three.